Hello, I'm Alice McKenzie, and welcome to What's a Preacher to Do, a series of brief interviews that have been um, sponsored by the Perkins Center for Preaching Excellence, prompted by our current stew of COVID-19 and, and systemic racism and political division. Today, my guest is Dr. Thomas G. Long, the Bandy Professor of Preaching Emeritus at Emory University's Candler School of Theology. Dr. Long is a compelling teacher a master preacher, a sought after speaker and a prolific author. And after the interview, I direct you to our website where you can see um, a list of his publications and uh, they are all must reads for preachers. So long before social media coined the term influencers, Dr. Long filled the bill as he has influenced and continues to influence generations of preachers uh, and their congregations and all that they encounter. And I have to say that I am the fortunate recipient of his influence. He was a very patient uh, advisor, my doctoral dissertation, just a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> and uh, in the time since then, uh, has been a valued colleague and a cherished friend. So Tom, I appreciate your being with us today. Pleasure to be with you. And thank you for that hyperbolic introduction. <laughs> <laughs> After that, you're eager to hear what you have to say, right? <laughs> So um, what is a key piece of advice that you would offer to preachers in these trying times? Well, indeed, they are trying times. And I think all of us who preach, uh, both by virtue of changing the media through which we preach and also recognizing what's going on in our society in all kinds of ways, feel the pressure um, to do something extraordinary. Hmm. And... I think my key piece of advice would be to resist that pressure that there is nothing more needed now than what we have always done. Um, the steady task of getting up and preaching the gospel uh, is heard in a new way now. It, I remember after 9-11, old hymns like a mighty fortress suddenly took on new power. Mm. We didn't have to rewrite the hymns. We just sang the hymns we've always sung. And I think there is some uh, terrific impact of just getting up there and faithfully preaching the gospel uh, week in and week out. Hmm. Uh, beyond that, uh, the, the emphasis I think that this time calls on us uh, to uh, provide is one on hope. Hmm. And Christian hope is really different from progress. Um, progress assumes we have already at hand the resources to make a better future. And hope is always surprised by the power of God that's larger than our own uh, resources. Mm. I was um, uh, reading a piece the other day in which a, a Zen master was having a conversation with a Trappist monk. And he said, you know, I, uh, the Zen master said, you know, I like Christianity, but only when it emphasizes resurrection. Give us your resurrections. Mm. And I, I think preachers now um, should look for those apertures in the world, those places where the radiance of Easter shines through. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, the kneeling of policemen in the presence of protesters mm -hmm. um, as an act of uh, solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, or I, I read an obituary in the New York Times uh, just a few days ago about a baker in Milan, Italy, who put out on the sidewalk during the COVID time baskets of bread uh, mm -hmm. and rolls. Mm -hmm. And suddenly those baskets of bread and rolls became a place where everybody in Milan brought gifts of food to give to those uh, who needed it. Uh, there's just a little sign of resurrection uh, creeping through. And the gospel says, trust that mm. more than the darkness that otherwise uh, envelops us. Right. And as we move into Advent, there is a lot of darkness, of course, a lot of loss of livelihood and life. And um, I remember in um, hearing you say and write about um, funerals. And in your book, Accompany Them with Singing. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, when students ask me, uh, what should they say about uh, the communion of saints? I say, just read from Dr. Long's book. <laughs> because that's <laughs> a beautiful uh, treatment of that. But, but um, in terms of um, death and the difficulties of death, you do talk about what is the challenge to um, 
to people's faith when they are surrounded by these losses. And it seems like that glimmer of hope is something that we can offer them that no one else can. Yeah, I was just reading uh, Terry Eagleton's book, Hope Without Optimism, hmm. um, which in, in which he really tries to gather up, I think, the Christian affirmation that uh, our hope does not um, you know, depend on a notion of the glass as, all, as half full. It depends on a notion of a God who, who saves us. And at a funeral, what we were really doing, uh, I mean, we we're enshrouded by darkness at a funeral. We, we march to the grave or to the crematorium. <laughs> and uh, it, it, even at the grave, our shout is hallelujah. Uh, and, and the funeral is an act of defiance. Uh, it, it, it actually says we trust this more than the darkness. We trust this more than we do death. Right, right. When, um, when the uh, COVID, COVID first hit, uh, there was this sort of almost um, frenzy of humanistic optimism or, or um, pull right. together. And there were a lot of um, commercials and public service announcements that would say things like, um, we will get through this and we are in this together. And I kept thinking, if I were preaching every week, I would, I would want to frame that theologically. What are we in together? Right. <laughs> and well, and what, um, how will we get through this? Well said. Yeah. yeah I mean, we almost saw a cartoon uh, version of this with, uh, we're going to uh, get through this by Easter. It'll be all over. It'll disappear uh, m magically. Uh, the, the false promises of optimism and the false promises of people who feel like any problem that is thrown our way, we already have the strength and resources to handle it. This has put us back on our heels. Uh, I mean, we're all hoping for the science to produce the vaccines that uh, protect us. And that will be an answer to prayer when it comes. Um, but uh, the Christian faith finds hope even in the darkest places when the resources don't appear to be there. Right, right. I, I, uh, I know you've written um, and talked about how uh, we proclaim a narrative that we couldn't conjure up on our own. Exactly. To me, that's, exactly. That, I think that's really what you're, what we have. Yeah. To, we have to Wendell offer. Berry's got an essay in his book, The Art of Loading Brush, in which he uh, takes off after people who try to predict things. Uh, he says, farmers are always trying to predict the weather always trying to predict the harvest, always trying to predict uh, what's going to happen in the marketplace. He said, I get that, but ultimately it is a refusal to accept the God of surprises. Yeah. <laughs> uh, God of Easter is ultimately a God of surprises. Exactly, exactly. So um, in terms of these theological resources, it would be good, wouldn't it, if, if preachers could, and if people could hear something about ecclesiology during Advent, maybe. Or, ah, yeah, the, the, the notion of the community of faith as a, a community of hope, a, a kind of a defiant protest right. against the approaching darkness. Right. Yes. So we are in this together. Well, here, here is what we are in. We're yeah, in the right. stew and also in, in the and community. That's what's so touching to me as I parachute into various streaming worship services these days. They're not any of them what we would hope for. We, we miss getting together. We miss touching each other. We miss the Eucharist. We miss the physicality. It, it, it's exposed how physical Christian worship re really is. Right. Right. But there's a brave defiance when, you know, a, a minister is there preaching into an empty sanctuary and streaming it out on Zoom. There's a sitting at the kitchen table and preaching the gospel the best she can right. um, as a kind of, uh, th this will not be overcome by the darkness. This light is going to keep on right. shining. Right. I heard it described as domestic preaching from my home to your <laughs> home. <laughs> and I, I was watching the news the other night and um, this very professional um, meteorologist was in her home and get, giving the weather with her graphics and her huge dog came and jumped in her lap. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that's kind of domestic weather, <laughs> weather reporting. <laughs> I was um, all creatures bright and beautiful. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I was watching. Uh, speaking of the physicality, I was watching the news, and they talked about um, a care home in Alaska that has made a hugging wall, and it's just a sheet of plastic, uh, and it's uh, held up by duct tape, 
and they put holes through it. And they showed uh, grandmothers hugging their babies and great grandmothers hugging their grandchildren. And it's just, it's just really, yeah. uh, to me, that's such a glimmer of hope. And then they have to disinfect it in between. <laughs> but, but it's just. I see, it's, it's tragic and it's touching, but I see the ER nurses who hold the FaceTime uh, telephones up so that loved ones can at least have some contact in a dying moment as right. oddly enough, a sign of resurrection. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I keep coming back to these theological resources because I do think that that is, um, I resonate to that in your work across what you've written. Um, and, and what about eschatology? I mean, we need to say something about the hope that's coming, um, not just the hope that we have in the present. Yeah, um, Herbert McCabe, the Catholic theologian, thinks of uh, the life of the Trinity uh, is like a, a movie that is projected onto history. Hmm. And when it's projected onto history, it becomes the story of Jesus and the resurrection and the ultimate consummation of all things happening chronologically in history. Hmm. But it's already there in eternity. The fullness of the victory is already there. Hmm. And that's why I think from time to time in these little weep holes in history and experience, hmm. we can see the ultimate thing itself. We can see the glory of God, the resurrection poking through and we trust that's the way it really is. That's the yeah. way it really is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, a good word. Now, uh, I know that you've taught your students and taught me that you should always end your sermon with a, uh, a good story, right? And so, <laughs> so we could talk on and on and I would love to, but, uh, but uh, as Fred Craddock used to say, we've come to the end of our little ball of twine. <laughs> So, You're getting so, me a little afraid here at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's my invitation. So, so here's my story. Uh, here's my story. So, um, as, as uh, viewers probably know, uh, Dr. Long uh, has written the most um, most used textbook of the last 25 years, "The Witness of Preaching," in which he has the novel idea that we actually have one theme <laughs> and have uh, an intention in our sermons. So. Um, I have tried faithfully to teach people that and to uh, put that in practice. So a couple of years ago, I was preaching at a church in Dallas. We won't say which one. And at the end of the service, a woman came up to me uh, with her eyes glistening with tears and took my hand. And she said, I can't thank you enough. I said, oh, she said, you only talked about one thing. <laughs> and she said, I understood everything that you said. <laughs> and I said, of course, I said, don't thank me, thank Tom Long. <laughs> so, so Tom, uh, we can't thank you enough, both for being uh, with us in this interview and for um, way beyond your contributions as they continue into the future. It's a pleasure, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.